Hi, welcome to the pursuit of truth. Um, so I haven't done one of these for a while. I finished uh, Inside Our Autistic Minds with Chris Packham and the, well, the reason I haven't been is my wife hasn't been well. Wow. Um, so I, I haven't had um, time to record these because I've just been worrying and, and thinking about that. It's funny how in life you uh, it just makes you think about, you know, the end and I've been thinking a lot about that now because I'm worried. Um, but I think she's going to be okay. It's just, you know, when someone's not well and they're, you know, she's a strong person when she sort of seems weak and in pain, it's like, it just makes you worry about those final moments. You know, sometimes I get this where I feel a pain in my heart and I think, you know, you know, and I start <laughs> catastrophizing about it and worrying that, oh, this is going to be the moment, you know? But that moment one day will come, as much as each time it's not that moment, it's just me worrying about over nothing. But one day that moment will come for all of us, and it's just... Oh, it's quite scary, really, to let go of all the things that you love. I don't care of all the trinkets and things, but it's the people, my wife, my children. I always think about how, how they will cope, as if I'm letting them down, like... I want me and my wife to live to an old age so that by the time we go, our children will be married or grown up and we'll be able to easily let go of us. I don't want it to happen when they're young now, when they love so much. And I just can't imagine how, how that feels. But it happens to people. How do children ever get over that? And I wonder the children get troubled because imagine, you know, I, I know my twins, how much they love us. and. You know, when I get out of the car, they start crying, and it's like, imagine that, you know, that you're, as they would say, oofed <laughs> for good. Anyway, I'm getting off the track. Um, but there was another bit I wanted to mention, is when, with the surgery, there was this, uh, it was a deaf person, and I was just thinking about how difficult it is for disabled people, because the world is set up for neurotypicals, and obviously when they hire receptionists they don't think and they should do in this day and age they don't think about having braille or having people who can do sign language because you know he could speak a little bit but some deaf people they they can't speak at all and they can come and do sign language because that's and then the reception is not going to know it's just so difficult being a person who isn't neurotypical in a world that is still only looking at that And anyway, so I finished uh, Inside Autism. I was really good. The first one I think was better than the second one. The first one with um, a lot of good examples of, of well, it opened my mind to, you know, the, especially like how some people may think that autistic uh, people don't have anything going on in the mind just because they're shy, they don't talk. And yet there's so much going on. Well, all of that, both episodes showed that, you know, with, and it just made me think when I was hearing these things, it was like I was ticking off these boxes of, well, yeah, I recognize that. Like I recognize noise, yeah, noise does. Especially now with the twins, when they start screaming and shouting, I can't concentrate if they're making noise. And it's like, please stop making noise. And it really jolts me and it's a really weird experience. And, and then obviously I had a very lonely childhood and in like school and I started writing poetry to, you know, that's why I created John Doyle, John Doyle poem, it's not my name, it's just my pseudonym for my poems when I was at school and college to, you know, because I was making a film and I wanted to use one of my poems, so I came up with this name, John Doyle, just to hide it, so it said written by John Doyle as if it was some famous person, <laughs> but it was just me hiding behind that and I've hidden you know, my whole YouTube for 13, 14 years is under that name. That pseudonym, ma that masking, that my ability to say the things that I was too scared to say under my own name. And I saw that in, there was a rapper who was uh, writing lines and he was putting his experiences. And they often say that autistic children are very creative. I've seen that with my daughter, how she's sourcing her own uh, videos and editing on Kind Master. And oh, there's a video on here about it. Um, I need to put it on, I think. It's on the Maguire Twins UK, their own channel. 
she uploads her own videos <laughs> I have to keep deleting them <laughs> and she keeps editing these things doing slow motion changing things very creative at five I mean some adults won't be able to do this kind of level of editing sourcing it masking doing all these things you know cutting around images and making them transparent watching videos on YouTube and then trying to recreate them like black hole and emoji maze and things but yeah it was a really interesting program and it made me think about you know whether I am undiagnosed autistic and it would explain a lot of the things and the way I am because I always thought it was just because I was socially inept or something or just the way I've been brought up I don't know uh, Yeah. But it, it is very eye-opening and it, it makes you see that how we have to, well, we really need to adapt. That's a letter I'm writing to the government, education secretary and a few others. And I know it's probably not going to make any difference because, you know, thousands of people are striking and still people aren't listening or even attending meetings for them. So why would they listen to little old me writing my letter about my child's experience? But I can't just do nothing, because to do nothing is, well, nothing's going to change if you do nothing. You can't just moaning about it. You have to stand up and say, well, this doesn't make sense to me, like with the funding. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And I don't see how anyone, especially someone who's charged with the educational, looking after us as a society, can say the way we treat neurodiverse and disabled and autistic children is in the same way as we... The problem is because most people come up with these systems and neurotypical and they don't think about these things the same as like the surgery didn't think of employing a receptionist who could do sign language or have braille on the counter or have a set of questions in braille ready for the people to come in like what's your name and what time is your appointment and go to this room and etc. Same with the system of the schooling. It was set up for neurotypicals and they've, they've just made little tweaks but the tweaks aren't happening at the same stage, so they're not benefiting. You know, that's why like with my daughter's funding, 20, week, 20 weeks to decide whether to help out a child that needs help, that we knew from day one needed help. And do you want to give that, make 20 weeks to make a fucking decision? And then in a year, you know, once she gets to year one, then suddenly she'll have some money, which probably still won't be enough to do the things that they want. Because well, I think the mainstream school, they just want to, well, they started at six weeks talking about a different school or a special school. I think that's their solution is, well, we're for mainstream. But yeah, anyway, it's a good documentary and it's worth the watch. Take care, take easy, rest and peace.